Hi guys and welcome back to M17 Labs in Poland. I'm Wojciech Sierra Papa 5 with Whiskey Papa and today we've got the remote radio unit on my desk. So that's our new design. It uses two CC1200 chips for uh, reception and transmission and it's a state-of-the-art as I would say because uh, you don't see many transceivers that are do-it-yourself projects that utilize RF isolators like the remote radio unit does. So let's take a look what's inside the remote radio unit. This device is a complete transceiver, meaning that it can transmit and receive RF at the same time, so it's full duplex. It's supplied with 13.8 volts DC. That voltage goes to two uh, voltage regulators. One of them supplies the logic and gives 3.3 volts. The other one is 5 volts and supplies the automatic level control and the temperature sensor. Then uh, we've got the STM32 part. That's the logic of the whole device. It controls everything, both the transmitter, receiver, automatic level control and also the SWR bridge and the power amplifier. Then it also handles all of the communication between the remote radio unit itself and the external world. That protocol is called Common Amateur Radio Interface, called CARI for short. That's our own design as well. Let's go further. This is the transmitter. It's a CC1200 chip. It's capable of outputting about 13 dBm uh, RF power at 70 centimeter band. So that's about 20 milliwatts. That RF signal goes to the power amplifier. Power amplifier can output about 60 watts without any problems. And this power amplifier comes from uh, Mitsubishi, I believe. Right after that, we've got the RF circulator uh, and the dummy load. Then there's an SWR bridge, a double directional coupler. So between the isolator and the output, there's a bridge to tell us how much power do we have at the output. That's the incident power and we can also tell how much power gets back from the load so how much power is reflected back to the transmitter that's the that's this part then we've got the receiver uh, it's directly connected to the antenna input or the, the input RF input then we've got the automatic lever control uh, that's used to stabilize the power output of the RF part. It di directly drives the power amplifier. So you can set the power output from the power amplifier to anything between 1 watt to 50 watts continuous wave. As it's an envelope detector, it works best with constant envelope modulations like FM, M17 included, AFSK, this big transistor right here uh, is a MOSFET used to turn on the power amplifier when it's needed. In this revision, we've got two CC1200 chips, uh, both clocked at 40 MHz using this TCXO right here. So there's a single TCXO, and after that, generator we've got uh, a NOT gate that generates a square wave so it gets a clipped sign input and outputs a square wave that's split into two of those chips CC1200 chips so they are clocked from the same source now how does the isolator work mm, let's take a look at that uh, so imagine that you've got nothing connected to it, uh, like in this case. So the RF isolator 
uh, takes anything that comes in into port 1 and outputs it at port 2 and whatever comes from port 2 it's being output at port 3 and then the circle closes and whatever comes in at port 3 it gets output at port 1 so hence the name circulator so why is this so important to have something like this in uh, a remote radio unit? Imagine that there is a failure at the load of the antenna. So imagine that the antenna gets destroyed or something bad happens to it. In that case, all of the RF power would be reflected back, or at least most of that power would be reflected back and destroy the power amplifier, but in our case the reflected power is going to be dissipated at the dummy load. Nothing would come back uh, to the power amplifier. That's the reason to use an RF isolator in a device like this one. Now, uh, this device is controlled over common amateur radio interface and that interface is actually meant to uh, carry baseband, uplink and downlink, control and telemetry data. So that's a whole set of commands and uh, data transfers that can be supported by the protocol, the carry. And between the remote radio unit and the outside world, you need to have something called interface. I have built my own interface with the use of a Raspberry Pi, and it converts UART between the STM32 and the Raspberry Pi to carry, that's carried by the Ethernet and then through the optical fiber down to the basement unit. You can probably tell that I'm not really used to taking videos, but in the case of the remote radio unit, I think it's very important to have a demonstration video because it's a breakthrough for the amateur radio world. So let's take a look at the internal structure of the remote radio unit. And as you can see, we've got two CC1200 chips and they are both sharing the same SPI bus connected to the STM32. Then we've got a temperature sensor that is connected to uh, the STM32's ADC input. Then we've got the MOSFET that is used to turn the power amplifier on and off. Uh, we've got a big, big capacitor to store some energy for the power amplifier. And this one does the same job, but for the whole device. Then we've got the connector for the DA15. Uh, external connector for the UART and stuff like that. We've got different signals exposed like the SPI bus, uh, the reflected power, forward power as voltage of course. Uh, then we've got UART and the reset pin and power amplifier enable pin which is used for safety. So both receiver and transmitter use the same SPI bus uh, that's the dummy load. Now, the automatic level control, that's the most interesting part of this device probably. So the automatic level control circuitry uh, consists of a dual operational amplifier, which is precise one. I don't remember which model it is exactly. And I have to be quite careful when I poke around uh, around the device uh, with my screwdriver because the device is energized so we don't want any sparks here or magic smoke at least not now uh, what's very important is that the automatic level control works best with continuous envelope modulation modes so FM is one of them and that's because the frequency of the output changes but its amplitude is kept constant. That's how FM works. Uh, if there is any residual AM component, it's going to be visible uh, on the spectrum, and that's unwanted, so we don't want that. 
Then we've got the dual directional coupler that is right here. It's used to measure the power output from the device. You can also measure the power that comes back to the device from a mismatched load. Normally, if the load is perfect, so perfectly 50 ohms, uh, you should be not getting anything back. But of course, we are not living in a perfect world. Most of the time, you've got some power coming back. Even if I connected uh, an attenuator or a dummy load, I would get some power coming back from the from that load. So both of these powers are uh, measured through the uh, AD8313, I believe. That's from analog devices. And both of them work as a power to voltage converters, power sensors, if you will. And both voltages are routed to the ADC uh, of the microcontroller and are available through telemetry channel over carry. So that's very important. Uh, if there is any load mismatch, you can detect it pretty much in real time using carry using its telemetry channel. So when the basement unit, which is the device that is at the other end of the optical fiber, detects that there is some failure, or be it a load fault or the feed line is broken or whatever, that event can be detected. And even if it happens, you get two things. You get the power that comes back uh, dissipated at the dummy load and you get uh, a warning over the telemetry channel. I mean, it's not a warning itself, but uh, you can tell at the basement unit level that something is bad. Something bad is going on because you've got elevated reflected power detected at the directional coupler. So what we see here is actually the revision B of the device and I'm already working on revision C, which is going to have uh, quite a few improvements, including a low-pass filter right here, when, where the power amplifier section is. So we've got a strip line here that just takes some place and does nothing, nothing else than just passing RF power from the RF amplifier to the circulator. So I have decided to put the low pass filter uh, right there. This is the prototype of it. And I hope the focus is just about right. So it consists of two coils, air coils, and three capacitors. And it's able to get the second harmonic down to minus 70 or below minus 70 dBC below the carrier. So that's good. And that's going to be added to revision C. So let's focus on the common amateur radio interface that is used to control this device. And after we are done with the presentation, I'm going to share another video uh, showing how the common amateur radio interface works on a PC. So how it looks like at the other side of the optical fiber at the basement unit level. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let's take a look at the um, everything else that's not the remote radio unit on my desk. So, uh, as I said, that's the UART uh, path from the remote radio unit up to the uh, interface board. So the UART works at around 460,000 baud. So it's not rocket science, it's not some uh, super fast connection, but it's enough to do the job. So we've got UART in duplex, so you can transmit and receive baseband over UART, over that UART, and you can also transmit and receive control and telemetry back to the interface and the baseband unit. There is also SPI bus exposed at the DA15 connector, but that's only used for uh, 
debug purposes. So let's have a look again at the connections between the remote radio unit and the interface board. So as I said, we've got the UART RX and TX. We of course have ground. We have the power amplifier enable uh, strobe. So that's used for safety reasons to disable the power amplifier in case there is some failure of the interface board. Then we've got a uh, boot zero pin that's used for flushing the STM32 using the interface board. So you don't have to visit the site and use your SWD uh, interface to program the chip. So you can do it remotely at the basement unit level. And by the way, uh, I forgot to mention that we've got some test points here. Well, we've got two test points here that are at the uh, debug UART connector that I've got connected to my logic analyzer. And that also exposes a UART that is connected to my UART to USB converter. And then there's an SWD connector that I use to program the chip uh, efficiently because obviously uh, what we can get over the UART for programming purposes, it's not very it's not very fast. So instead of waiting over a minute to uh, flash the chip, I use SWD to speed this process up. Uh, the board is supplied with 13.8 volts using uh, this filter. It's a pass-through capacitor, so. Hopefully it stops most of the RF interference that would come out from the box. Then at the interface level, uh, we've got all of the connections that I have mentioned. Plus we've got Ethernet connection that goes to a Ethernet to optical fiber interface, which is a media converter, I believe. That's how it's called. And at the other side of the optical fiber, we've got my home network. So we can access the whole device uh, using my home network. Right now we have nothing connected to the RF output. And it is not a problem because we've got the RF circulator taking care of the power amplifier, so nothing bad happens. And the RF input is connected to the uh, deplexer that has of course nothing at the input because we have no antennas here so for reception we don't need we don't need anything else than just this simple setup the device itself can be upgraded by uh, replacing the CC 1200 chips that are only FM uh, capable with an SX 1255 SDR transceivers that can extend the capabilities of this device to basically any other modulation, not only FM. The Common Amateur Radio Interface, or CARI for short, uh, can be used to transfer baseband data, control and telemetry between devices. This device, uh, when connected to an interface like this one, uses reduced carry command set, I would say, because some of the commands are not available at this level. So the carry interface is actually meant to be used between the remote radio unit, but the interface board of it, and the basement unit. So it's not meant to be used for interface to the RF board connection. But of course it can be used <laughs> Uh, but not all of the commands uh, can be utilized. 